Now we're going to cover spinal cord disorders, which is in chapter 37 of our Hoffman and Sullivan text. The spinal cord has multiple functions, including somatic, which is voluntary, and autonomic, which is involuntary reflexes. It also includes motor control centers and sensory and motor modulation. It is the primary pathway connecting the brain to the rest of the body. The spine itself is complex in both structure and function. Patients with spinal cord disorders typically have symptoms that include problems with mobility, sensory perception, and pain. As clients have problems with their activities of daily living, then skin, tissue integrity, elimination patterns, and sexuality are often affected. In this chapter, we're going to discuss the pathophysiology and associated clinical manifestations with spinal cord disorders. We're going to explain the relevant diagnostic tests, the treatments, and develop an overall plan of care for clients experiencing spinal cord disorders. First, we're going to discuss low back pain, also known as lumbosacral pain. Lumbosacral pain has a complex pathophysiology and can be caused by spinal degeneration, spinal stenosis, or a muscle spasm. Spinal degeneration is the loss of normal structure and function which is associated with aging. We have facet joints which are small joints in between and behind each adjacent vertebra. This helps support vertebral movement which prevents slipping. With aging comes a decrease in our body's water which decreases the ability to lubricate these facet joints. This causes wear and tear. Spinal stenosis is constriction of the spinal canal, which applies pressure on the spinal cord and the nerve roots. This is frequently secondary to spinal degeneration. And a muscle spasm is sudden involuntary contraction, and this can also be related to muscle weakness. Clinical manifestations of lumbosacral pain include a dull or acute pain, which is exacerbated by movement. The pain leads to decreased flexibility and decreased stamina. Another sign or symptom can be a muscle spasm, which may limit mobility, and by limiting mobility, our patients are at risk for complications such as constipation or altered skin integrity. And the patient might experience numbness or tingling if the spinal nerves are involved. This is primarily seen in spinal stenosis. Diagnostics for lumbosacral pain include a CT scan, discogram, MRI, myelogram, x-rays, EMGs, and nerve conduction studies. The YouTube link on this slide will provide a video about EMJs, or excuse me, EMGs and nerve conduction studies. They also are highlighted in Table 37.1 in our text. Non-pharmacologic interventions include physical therapy, applying heat or ice, proper positioning, especially if a patient is at work or performing tasks at home, or complementary or alternative medicines such as acupuncture, yoga, meditation, massage therapy, or Qigong. Medications to help with low back pain include NSAIDs such as ibuprofen or Ketorolac, also muscle relaxants such as Soma or Cyclobenzaprine, otherwise known as Flexeril, as these depress our central nervous system. We could also administer anticonvulsants such as gabapentin, pregabalin, otherwise known as Lyrica, or carbamazepine, otherwise known as Tegretol. Tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline or nortriptyline can be administered. We can apply lidocaine topically to help with pain as well, or we can administer corticosteroids as these block inflammation. Last, we would try opioids or opioid narcotics like morphine, codeine, or oxycodone. And these are typically given as, for severe pain that is not responsive to the other classifications of medications. Now again, the book doesn't go into much depth about these medications because you have had them in previous units and in previous classes as well. So please take the time to understand what their mechanism of action is and any important nursing interventions that go along with them. Other interventional therapies for low back pain include nerve blocks, which are using anesthetic steroids or narcotics to help block the nerve that's, caught, that's either being compressed, which is causing pain. The patient can also have a transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, otherwise known as a TENS unit, or they may have surgery for serious pathology related to complications, such as a herniated disc, which is causing their low back pain. 
So our primary concern for patients with low back pain is pain control. And we just talked about different therapies that we can do to help control their pain. Patients are also at an increased risk for impaired mobility due to this pain and discomfort, and therefore they're at risk for impaired bowel elimination or altered skin integrity. So we need to perform interventions to help with constipation and to promote skin integrity. Overall, we want to give people with low back pain proper treatment to help restore their normal function. Proper treatment can include the medications that we've talked about or lifestyle changes such as decreasing their weight and improving their exercise. Proper posture, exercise, and the use of body mechanics during exercise and work also help reduce the patient's risk of a re-injury. Now we'll go on to herniated nucleus pulposus. As people age, the discs between the vertebrae degenerate and weaken, and the disc becomes more inflexible and prone to tearing or rupturing with movement. Remember, discs are avascular, so they do not have a blood supply. A tear in the outer fibrous ring, or annulus fibrosus, allows central soft component, the nucleus pulposus, to herniate. This can lead to inflammation and compression of the nerve root called radiculopathy. Specific nerve compressed determines the signs and symptoms and dysfunction that the patient will experience. Clinical manifestations of a herniated nucleus pulposus include pain, numbness or weakness, or inability to control motor movement. This can be correlated with spinal nerve dermatones that we covered in Chapter 35. Management of a herniated nucleus pulposus includes pain control, improving function, and preventing further injury. Non-pharmacologic interventions include the same as those we discuss for low back pain, such as physical therapy, proper body mechanics, um, stretching, weight loss if needed, um, or the alternative or complementary therapies such as massage therapy or acupuncture. Typically, most clients will have an improvement of their symptoms in one to two months. Pharmacologic interventions can include the administration of over-the-counter NSAIDs, muscle relaxants, or nerve pain medications such as gabapentin, pregabalin, duloxetine, or tramadol, and amitriptyline. These nerve pain medications often help relieve pain related to the nerve damage, and they have milder side effects, which puts them as first-line prescription medications for people with herniated discs. Surgical management may be needed when conservative treatment fails progressive neurological deficits are present, the patient has problems standing or walking, or they start to experience incontinence. There's different options for surgical interventions, such as a lamin laminotomy. And in a laminotomy, there's an opening made into the lamina to decrease pressure on the compressed nerve root or spinal cord. Patients can also undergo a microdiscectomy, which the disc is removed to relieve pressure on the spine or the nerve root involved. A laminectomy is part of the lamina is removed to relieve pressure on the spinal cord and nerve roots, and this allows the surgeon better visualization of the herniated disc. Patients can also have an artificial disc replacement, which is a manufactured disc to replace the diseased disc, or they can have a spinal fusion, which is the joining of two bones or the two vertebrae together. Permanently joining two vertebrae together means that there's going to be no longer movement in between them. So a spinal fusion is often performed with other surgical procedures like a laminectomy or a disectomy to provide spinal stability. In a spinal fusion, a bone graft, which can be an autograft or a bone graft from the client's own body, or an allograft, which is a bone graft from unrelated people, can be used, or metal hardware can be used to join the vertebra together. Overall, a lumbar fusion is the gold standard for patients with low back pain unrelieved by conservative measures. Complications of a herniated nucleus pulposus include numbness and weakness, incontinence, increased pain or chronic pain, or even saddle anesthesia, which is the loss of sensation to the inner thighs, back of legs, and around the rectum. Priority nursing management includes monitoring their neurological status for decline, and this is directly related to the numbness or weakness that they can experience. We also need to assess range of movement and maintain functionality, and we want to administer medications to provide comfort and mobility, and we've discussed these medications already. Overall, we need to provide medication teaching for safety, 
For example, if they are provide, if they are prescribed cyclobenzaprine, which is a central nervous system depressor, then they cannot drive as that can affect their ability to drive safely on the road. We also want to teach them muscle strengthening exercises and proper stretching techniques. And speaking of techniques, we need to teach them proper lifting techniques. And nurses themselves need to follow proper lifting techniques, such as raising the bed to a comfortable working height. Now we'll talk about multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune chronic disorder in which the nerves of the central nervous system degenerate due to a buildup of scar tissue known as sclerosis or plaques formed during demyelination. The degree of demyelination and location determines the patient's symptoms and the severity of the disease process. Women are typically affected more than men and Caucasians are affected more than any other type of ethnicity. There's four different types of multiple sclerosis, relapsing and remitting, which is the most common form, secondary progressive, which starts off as relapsing and remitting, but then progresses into deterioration. There's also progressive relapsing, which is continual exacerbations with no, new, no real recovery in between. And then the fourth type is primary progressive. So they have no exacerbations, just gradual progression and can have temporary plateaus. The web link on this slide will overview multiple sclerosis. Please follow that if you'd like to have that additional information. Otherwise, manifestations of multiple sclerosis can include double or blurred vision, optic neuritis, which is some vision loss and pain with eye movement, numbness or weakness in one or more limbs, tingling or pain, an electric shock sensation with head movement, tremor, unsteadiness or uncoordinated movements, fatigue or dizziness. There's no specific diagnosing test for multiple sclerosis, so we need to obtain an accurate history and physical and neurological exam. Then we perform labs and other diagnostics to rule out possible other diseases. There's no cure for multiple sclerosis, so treatment is focused on improving speed of recovery from attacks, reducing attacks, or slowing the progression of the disease. Medications to slow the disease progression include immunomodulators like beta interferons such as Avonex and Extavia, or they can include immunosuppressants such as natalizumab. Medications used to aid in the speed of recovery from attacks include steroids such as prednisone and hydrocortisone, and medications to treat clinical manifestations include muscle relaxants such as baclofen, antimuscarinics such as Destrol, Detrol, excuse me, and stool softeners such as docusate sodium. Table 37.4, medications used to treat multiple sclerosis, is a very good summarization of the classes and mechanisms of actions for the medications that we typically see in multiple sclerosis. Please review that. Fatigue, overexertion, and overheating can stimulate multiple sclerosis exacerbations. So it's important to educate our patients to avoid those things by having adequate rest periods and staying cool. We also want to have them eat a healthy and balanced diet to have an ideal body weight and have stress relieving measures as stress can also trigger an exacerbation of multiple sclerosis. Because multiple sclerosis involves nerves of our central nervous system, our complications can vary, but they can include muscle stiffness and spasticity, paralysis, bowel, bladder, or sexual dysfunction, mental changes, depression, seizures, problems for mobility, and speech deficits. Priority nursing assessments include monitoring their neuromuscular function, their eye and vision movements, monitoring skin integrity, and their ability to form activities of daily living. There's changes in mobility, sensation, and vision, and the patient is at an increased risk for falls and injury. So it's also important to educate the patient on safety measures, such as visual scanning and checking water temperature before entering a bathtub or shower. We also want to promote medication compliance to prevent exacerbations. Overall, we want to keep the patient as active and functional as possible and to provide symptomatic relief and to prevent exacerbations from occurring.